Hello and welcome to my video on early modern Japan and China. Um, I'm going to talk today about both of these countries and I'm going to start with Japan. And the first section to talk about is called the Warring States Era and it lasts from 1467 to 1615. This is a period of constant internal war and anarchy and it disrupts all of Japanese society. Uh, the country is technically run by an emperor, but the emperor has given power to this warlord known as the Shogun. Uh, below the Shogun are lords known as Daimyo. Uh, these feudal lords, they own the land that the peasants work on. And then controlled by the Daimyo are Samurai. And these Samurai are the elite soldiers of the Japanese military and they serve their lord or Daimyo. Uh, this all begins because the power of the Ashikaga Shogunate begins to collapse. The Ashikaga Shogunate, which is before our class here, uh, they, those shoguns never really gain control over all the daimyo, and some of them fight against the shogunate for control of the country. There's also increased trade with China that's going to lead to a desire for greater local autonomy and greater local control. And the Warring States period, it doesn't end until the rise of three warlords, or great unifiers as they're known. There's Oda Nobunaga, uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, and Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now the first of these three unifiers is Oda Nobunaga, uh, and he's going to be in control of the government from 1578 to 1582. He's the head of the powerful Oda clan, and he's actually the most powerful daimyo of the late 1500s, and he's known as the first great unifier in Japanese history. In 1573, Nobunaga is going to challenge the then shogun Ashikaga Yoshiaki, and he's going to beat the shogun's army in a battle. And this defeat of shogun Yoshiaki is going to drive him from the capital and give Nobunaga control of the government. Now that officially ends the Ashikaga shogunate that had been around for about 150, 200 years at that point. And Nobunaga is going to be given the power of the government by the emperor. Now after gaining the support of the emperor, Nobunaga is going to continue to challenge the other daimyo and the other clans for supreme control of Japan. Uh, his life is going to end with a ritualistic suicide known as seppuku. Uh, he's going to be surrounded by en enemy forces when he's inside a temple, and rather than be taken hostage, uh, he's going to commit seppuku, this ritualistic suicide. The second great unifier is Toyotomi Hideyoshi. Uh, this guy is originally a peasant, but he's going to become the second in command to Nobunaga. And after Hideyoshi gains control, uh, he's going to continue to unite Japan in the name of his old lord. Uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he's going to initiate an event that's known as the Great Sword Hunt. And in the Great Sword Hunt, samurai are going to be required to prove their noble descent. They have to prove that they have the nobility and the wealth to remain samurai. And if they can't prove their nobility, if they can't prove their wealth and they're disarmed, their samurai sword is taken away from them, their rank is taken away from them, and they are forced back into being peasants. Uh, by the time the Great Sword Hunt is done, about 95% of the samurai are disarmed and forced to become peasants again. Only 5% of those who are samurai get to remain samurai. Now, following the Great Sword Hunt, Hideyoshi is going to attempt to free social classes. Uh, he's going to make it so that you must marry within your class and you must live within your class. He's also going to prohibit peasants from quitting their, their uh, working of the land for their daimyo. And he's going to prohibit samurai from quitting the services of their daimyo. Once the Great Sword Hunt is done, and once Hideyoshi attempts to freeze those social classes, he's going to end up invading Korea in 1592, but uh, he doesn't achieve victory, and his failure really damages his, his reputation. Uh, after his death, he leaves a young son named Hideyori, 
who was supposed to be the new Shogun, but he was only five years old. And because he was only five years old, a regency is formed where advisors are going to rule the country until Hideyori is old enough to do so. Now, this regency is going to fail, and it leads to something called the Battle of Sekigahara on October 21st of 1600. Uh, the two people who were the regents, there was Tokugawa Ieyasu and Ishida Mitsunari, and both of those are supposed to serve as advisors to the child shogun. Uh, however, Ieyasu begins to seize power from Ishida and Hideyori. Eventually, this power grab is going to be challenged by the Ishida clan and by the Toyotomi clan, who band together. Um, and that's what leads to the Battle of Sekigahara. Now, the Battle of Sekigahara, it happens October 21st, 1600, and it pits the Tokugawa clan and all of their allies against the Ishida clan and their allies. The Tokugawa clan is outnumbered, I think it's 120,000 to about 85,000 troops. It happens on the plains southwest of Osaka. Uh, it's right after a heavy downpour has ended. There's fog everywhere, and the two armies bump into each other almost on accident. Now, what Ishida Mitsunari doesn't know is that Tokugawa Ieyasu had secretly made a deal with a couple of Mitsunari's allies that said, hey, if you join my side in the middle of the fight, I'll give you land and I'll give you power. And during the battle, uh, one of those allies does change sides and that pretty much wins the battle for Tokugawa Ieyasu. Now this victory by Tokugawa is going to usher in the Tokugawa period or Tokugawa era, and that goes from 1603 all the way until 1868. After winning the Battle of Sekigahara, Tokugawa Ieyasu is going to become the new shogun, uh, officially from 1603 to 1605, but in reality he is going to be the power in Japan until his death in 1616. He's going to do a couple of things to reorganize Japan. One of the things he does is he moves the capital from Osaka and Kyoto to Edo, which is now known today as Tokyo. Tokyo means new capital or eastern capital. Uh, he also confiscated the lands of his defeated enemies, and he moved Daimyo around so that his closest allies controlled the land nearest to his own. Tokugawa Ieyasu is going to, con uh, he's going to continue the sword hunt. He's going to further limit who could be a samurai. That way he could control the military. And he was not a very popular guy because he only allowed lords to marry or repair their castles if he gave permission. Uh, he required wives and children of other daimyo to live at his castle in Tokyo and the daimyo or the lords themselves were required to live there every other year. And if they didn't follow through with that, then he came and he found them and forced them. There were new laws passed to control the courts, the temples, the shrines, the lords, you name it. Many of these laws are based on loyalty and order. Uh, there's a very famous story called the 47 Ronin. And in the 47 Ronin, it happens in 1701, and it's a true story. Uh, a regional lord or a regional daimyo has been insulted at court and draws his sword to defend himself, but he's in the presence of the emperor, and to draw your sword in presence of the emperor is a capital offense. So this lord is required to commit suicide, and he does so because of his loyalty to the emperor. Well, his death left his 47 samurai without a master, and that's where the word ronin comes in. Ronin means masterless samurai. So this meant that those 47 samurai lost their land, they lost their standing, they lost their, their position, and basically had to share in the disgrace of their lord. For a year, these 47 ronin bide their time, and then they rose up in an organized attack to kill the man that had insulted their lord and 
which brought their downfall. These 47 samurai bring the head of the enemy to the grave of their lord and pay honor to their fallen daimyo. Their actions were widely respected throughout Japan, but the Tokugawa government ordered them to commit suicide to appease the assault done to the state. And because these 47 ronin, these 47 samurai, were loyal to the government, they followed through and they committed seppuku, or ritualistic suicide, because they were told to do it. And these 47 ronin end up being considered martyrs because they put their duty and their honor above their own lives. So this is a society that exists on laws based on loyalty and honor. Another law that's passed by the Tokugawas is this national policy of seclusion. It starts in 1630 and it banned foreigners, specifically Portuguese, from visiting Japan. Uh, the Chinese were still allowed and the Dutch were still allowed in certain ways, but for the most part, all outside visiting to Japan becomes strictly forbidden. Even the Japanese who leave the country and try to come back, they were subject to the death penalty. And this seclusion act is going to be in force all the way until 1854. Now what happens with the Tokugawa economy? Uh, Japan experiences a pretty long period of peace and seclusion. And it goes all the way until 18, the 1860s from 1630. Uh, there are some problems that develop though. Like uh, by 1700, the economy is approaching the limits of what it can do because of population increases and agricultural uh, limits. There's just not enough places to grow enough food. Uh, things got so bad that contraception was forced and infanticide was practiced, meaning the, the killing of what they considered excess children. And that was meant to control the population increases. Even so, uh, there is a strong internal market that kept commerce flowing throughout Japan. Uh, there's no industrialization, though, and without industrialization, they were limited in what they could do. Uh, eventually, the Japanese economy is going to slow almost to a halt. Things remain mostly the same up until the 1850s. And when Japan reopens to the world in the late 1850s, early 1860s, uh, life is pretty much the same in Japan in 1860 as it was in 1660. There's not much change. All right, China. And for China, there are two dynasties that we're going to look at. There's the Ming and the Qing. The Ming and the Qing dynasties are very similar, so I've just kind of put them together into one video lecture here. The Ming Dynasty, it rules from 1368 to 1644, and the Qing, they rule from 1644 to 1911. Now, the Ming Dynasty, their main claim to fame is to get rid of any Mongol influence that had come in during the previous Wan Dynasty, and they kind of bring back Chinese culture where the Mongolians pushed it to the side. But eventually they're going to be overthrown by a group of people called the Manchus who were located in northeast China in a place called Manchuria. Now these Manchus eventually become known as the Qing. Uh, that's where the name comes from, Manchu, Qing. And the Qing emperors, they're going to be the last dynasty of Chinese history but they're also going to be the Chinese emperors who conquer Taiwan and really expand Chinese influence into Central Asia. With commerce, both for the Ming and the Qing, uh, originally they were existing in isolation and it was mostly an agricultural based or agrarian economy. But by the mid 1600s, trade starts to grow due to a rise in population and a reconnecting with outsiders. And the government relaxes its policies. Uh, what this does is it starts a commercial revolution that leads to China becoming the most commercialized non-industrial society in the world. China was doing so well that these private Shangxi banks open and a Shan, Shanxi 
bank was a bank owned by a private individual or a wealthy family that would serve as a place to facilitate trade, extend credit, do business, you name it. And these private Shangxi banks became so powerful and so important that they spread to Singapore, Japan, and even Russia. There's a lot of urban growth that happens, and most growth occurs in the intermediate market towns. And that's because these intermediate market towns, they provided the link between local markets and large provincial capitals. Uh, the family structure is still based on traditional Confucianist beliefs. Women were expected to obey men, um, the men obeyed elders, and then everybody obeyed the government and the emperor. Women were physically restricted, and there was this practice called foot binding that was meant to keep women in the home. Uh, basically, with foot binding, the foot is broken as a young child. Um, the foot heals, and then the young girl's foot is broken again until there's just these tiny, tiny little feet. And uh, I didn't put any pictures or anything of foot binding, but I encourage you to go to Google and you know take a look for yourself and see what you think. Both the Ming and the Qing dynasties had strong government, strong emperors, a full bureaucracy, a full administration. Uh, the emperor allowed his administration to run the government while he focused mainly on cultural and religious things. Education becomes extremely important. Uh, this education is based on the teachings of Confucius, and it spreads throughout China, especially when the civil service exam begins to be the only way that you can advance in your career, especially if you want a government career. Now, the way the civil service exam would work is a candidate would be screened at a local office, then allowed to take a county exam. If they passed the county exam, they became a member of what was known as the gentry. They're kind of like a lord, but not really. They're given some power, they're given some fame, they're given some land, but they're not a full-fledged lord yet. This candidate then is given the provincial exam, and the provincial exam is only given once every three years. If they pass that, then they're allowed to take the metropolitan exam, which also is given just once every three years. When it's all said and done, there are fewer than 90 people who pass the tests and get to work in the government each time the cycle is done. So if you're able to pass them, it's a very big deal and you are rewarded. Then finally, we have relations with the West. Uh, Europeans, they've known about China since ancient Roman times, but it's not really until the early to mid 1500s that large numbers of Europeans come. Some of these Europeans are going to visit as missionaries, the Jesuits, remember they're the Pope's stormtroopers. They come to China to, to um, convert people to Catholicism. Matteo Ricci is the most famous of these missionaries. He's going to master the Chinese language. He's going to share Western knowledge of math and science with Chinese scholars. And he's going to mix Chinese concepts and use Chinese concepts to explain Christianity. Other missionaries are going to compare the philosophies of Jesus to Confucius and they're also going to hold services in the Chinese language. Eventually, missionaries are going to complain to the Pope, hey, we shouldn't be doing these languages in Chinese. We need to be using Latin. And hey, why are we letting these Chinese do traditional ancestor worship when that doesn't seem to work with Christianity? The Pope is going to order an end to ancestor worship, and a Pope is going to order that all services be issued in Latin. And in return, the emperor named Kang Shi is going to order an end to the preaching of Christianity and kick out the missionaries. Now, there are some Europeans that come there just to make money and trade. The Dutch and the English specifically are going to come to, to China for that reason. There were some trading restrictions. 
Trading between Europeans and Chinese could only be done at the city of Canton, which is today known as Guangzhou, and it could only be done outside the city walls. Any other trading was illegal. Uh, the British East India Trading Company was probably the most famous group of traders, and they traded for tea and silk, and they paid in gold and silver. So that's a real quick rundown of what's going on in early modern China and early modern Japan. It gives you an idea of what, what it was like in the you know, 15, 16, 1700s. Now next week is supposed to be the midterm, and I'm going to be democratic, and I'm going to give you a choice. Um, our first time together face-to-face -to -face is supposed to be March 9th, and I can do one of two things. March 9th, when we come together for the first time in person, I can give you the midterm then in person, and I can do one last video lecture next week, or we can go ahead and do the midterm as the syllabus says without ever seeing each other, and then do a lecture the first time we meet. I want to hear what you think. Send me an email and let me know if you want to do the midterm next week without ever meeting each other, or if you would like to do the midterm the first week we see each other on March 9th. Um, just let me know. I can do it either way, and you know we'll be democratic about it. But uh, send me an email sooner rather than later because majority goes. If the majority say, let's go ahead and get the midterm done, we're doing the midterm next week. Until next time, though, uh, we'll talk to you. Just send me an email if you have any questions, concerns, and let me know again what you think about the midterm. Talk to you soon. Bye.